Alexa, turn on TV. Okay. Alexa, how old is Harrison Ford? Harrison Ford is 77 years old, too. Ugh. Hey Siri, can you bring up the Eagles Super Bowl 2017? Alexa, where's the nearest Chick-fil-A? Here are a few nearby ones. Hey, you guys want to go for Chick-fil-A? Yes! Are you guys ready for Chick-fil-A? Yes, 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 yes! I'm going to get waffle fries, Chick-fil-A sandwich, chicken nuggets, milkshake. I'm sorry, Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. Guys, Chick-fil-A is closed today, it's Sunday. <laughs> you knew it had to be a Sunday. Because every time I go there, there's a line halfway out the parking lot. And you can't even get inside. Hey, if you're new here, my name is Phil. So glad to have you here. Maybe you visit us over the holiday season. We're glad to have you because we're starting a series that we think is a perfect time to join in. All about asking questions. We put out in the fall these surveys to our congregation to say, whatever questions you have about faith, life, the Bible, religion, whatever, toss it at us. We'll sift through it. We'll come up with a series in, in the new year to dive into that. So I have to put up front, I'm not, I was a little concerned about this series coming into it because I think it implies a couple things. One, it implies that we have answers to all your questions, which we do not. We do not have answers to every question that you could possibly ask. We dig for answers. We're constantly searching for answers. We're going to do our best to answer some of those questions, but hey, you guys can join. You guys want to share. Um, but we don't have all the answers to the questions. It also implies that we could answer some of the deepest questions in life in one sermon. And that's not true either. We can't do that in 30, 35 minutes. Some of the deep questions that you might be asking, we're not going to be able to address. But what we hope this series does is it opens conversation. It, that we create some kind of dialogue out of this. And Brian and I, we sit and chat all week long about theology and the Bible. And he tosses out words that I can't even pronounce. And we do all this stuff. And, we have a lot of fun doing that. You're welcome to be a part of that. We'd love you to join in the conversation. Stop in the office. Our doors are open to you. Let's go have lunch. Let's get together. We'd love to answer questions or just be a part of the dialogue. So that's the hope in this series. So what we did is we took those questions and we sort of tried to dig to what's the heart of the question. Not the specific question, but what's behind it. What's the heart of it? Because some were similar. And we compiled those to, to give answers that will hopefully answer all the questions in one. And then there were other questions that were so broad that we're not going to be able to tackle in one sermon, so we're looking in the future to try to do a series on some of those questions. So if your question is not answered in the series, just keep in mind that we're, we're hoping to come back to it in another series. But I'm tasked with the responsibility this morning of answering questions about money asking questions or answering questions about money. And money is a tough subject because it's so personal and private. Uh, I grew up understanding that there were two things. You didn't ask somebody, you didn't ask how much money they made, and you didn't ask who they voted for. And those seem to be open game in our culture today. But th that's how I grew up. You don't ask those questions. It's sort of like you don't ask a woman if she's pregnant. I've learned uh, you just don't do that. Unless you want to face the wrath of being wrong, you don't ask that question. So, there could be a lady in our congregation who literally is about to have the baby any second now, and sh I will not ask. I'm not going to say anything about it. And maybe you're here and you're like, I've been trying to show my baby bump, and he's not congratulated me. He's not said anything. It's not that I'm oblivious. I'm just self-preserving. I'm not going to say anything about it. There's just certain things you don't talk about. And somebody asked a question specifically 
about tithing, and we're not going to dive completely into that, but I want to address it a little bit. If that word is new to you, tithing was a concept that started with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, and it actually started long before the Mosaic Law. It started with a man named Melchizedek, who was a priest, who Abraham gave a tithe to, which the word means literally a tenth portion or a tenth part. So they would give 10%. And in the Mosaic law, the Israelites were commanded to give a tenth portion of everything that they had. So here's a setup. When the Israelites leave Egypt, they come into the promised land. God had promised or allotted certain portions of that land to 11 of the 12 tribes of Jacob, the man who would later be named Israel, from which we get the concept of the nation of Israel. 11 tribes were given a portion. The 12th was not. The 12th was the Levitical tribe. Their portion came from the tithes of the other 11 tribes. So the other 11 would give a tenth of their their wine, a tenth of their fruit, of their grain, of their oil, of their cattle. And that would be used to support the Levites as they did priestly duties within the temple or tabernacle. So that was the structure. And that tenth or that tithe was used not only to support them, but you'll read, and I put these in your notes so you can check out some of the references later, but it was used also to help widows and orphans in their community. And there's a place where a prophet came on behalf of God and spoke to the people and and, in God's words said, test me to see that if you give me the best of your tithe, that was what they were to give, not the least, not, not whatever was left over, the best of what they had, test me, God said, and see if I am not able to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings in your life. And I believe that that God of Israel is the same God today. That's just a little side note. But that's the concept in the Israelite history. When you come into the church, the New Testament, Understand that it was Jewish men and women who instituted the church. Now, the word tithe is not used. And we don't talk about tithe here at CFC because the word is not used in the New Testament. I'm going to explain why, why we talk differently about that concept. But you'll see maybe similar concepts pull into the church. As you move into the church, there are challenges for them to care for one another, particularly widows and orphans. That's something that New Testament writers write about often, care for the widows and orphans. You see that in the start of the church, they're caring for widows and orphans. People are selling their possessions, some are selling properties and homes to take care of each other in the church. That was their heart and responsibility. And you read in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says, I'm coming, and when I come, put put aside the first, put, put aside your gift the first day of every week that you're going to take and I'm going to take back to help the church. So it was a concept that I can see where somebody could argue it f- sort of flows into the New Testament church. But what we believe is that's just the starting point. What the New Testament authors actually call us to is greater displays of generosity and sacrifice that are more in tune with the generosity and sacrifice that we see in Jesus Christ. That it's a tenth portion or that concept is just a starting point that springboards us into greater generosity. And we believe that because I, I think that there's a connection between our spiritual lives and what we do with what we have. So Jesus said this, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I love that he uses the term treasure It doesn't say where your coin is, where your money is, where your dollars are, where your treasure is. Because treasure, to me, it's bigger than just a thing. Treasure could be a noun, yes, I I have this treasure. But it also can be a verb, something that I treasure. I treasure my relationships or I treasure this possession. So Jesus says where your treasure is, your heart's going to follow. They're connected. And there was a man by the name of John, given the title John the Baptist, who shared a similar concept. He understood that there's a direct connection between our spiritual lives and what we do with what we have. And I say that specifically, guys, because I I was thinking of a title for this this sermon. I was going to give it the title, Money Matters, but the more I thought about it, that's not actually accurate. Money does not matter. The bills, pieces of paper that we give value, that's not what matters. What I do with my money matters. What I do with my resources, that's what matters. It's directly connected to my spiritual life. So here's John the Baptist. 
There are people coming. He's out in the wilderness. He's speaking on behalf of God. And everybody's coming out to hear from him, some to be baptized by him. They believe that he has the answers to give them new life, to free them from their oppression. So they come out to him. And here's what John says to them in Luke chapter 3. You brood of vipers. That's a great introduction when somebody walks into your house. Hey, you brood of vipers. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. See, John recognized that many of the individuals coming to him were not truly ready to surrender to God and enter the kingdom. They were only coming looking for an out, a get-out-of-jail-free card, some sort of quick solution to the wrath that they felt they were already receiving from God because the Romans were oppressing them, but a coming wrath of God. And John looks at them and says, you brood of vipers, who told you to flee that wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance. This term repentance, it literally means to turn. It's a change. If I'm going in this direction and I repent, it means now I'm turning and going in this direction. And he's saying produce fruit in keeping with. That phrase in keeping with, I want you to picture scales in a courtroom. The scales that have the bar that goes across and the chains that hang down and the balances. The word is saying that keep the scale balanced basically. That if on one side I'm saying I'm changed, John is saying, well, where's the fruit that balances that change, that shows that it's in tune with that change? That he understood that real surrender to God naturally resulted in change. And he looks at them and says, don't say our father's Abraham. Don't say just because we are ancestors of Abraham, we're good with God. And it makes me think that the same concept for us, many of us, we grew up in a church, our parents were Christians, they were faithful, and we think because our parents believed and our parents are Christians, we therefore are. But each one of us individually has a responsibility to believe in Jesus Christ. Do not say your father is this or that. Rather, have you individually believed in Jesus Christ? And when I do, and I surrender to him, every New Testament author understands a concept of change that will occur after that. I love how Paul says it to a young pastor named Timothy. He says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Notice that he doesn't say so that everyone will see your perfection. He doesn't say devote yourself to these things, be diligent in these things, so that in the end the whole world will see how perfect you are. He says so that they will see your perfection progress, that who you were yesterday, you're not today, and who you were 10 years ago, you won't be 10 years from now, that there's this expectation, not that we achieve some sort of perfection that only Jesus Christ has, but that we are progressing and changing, that I'm not who I used to be. And John makes this connection between what we have and what we do with what we have in our spiritual lives. So they ask him, okay, produce fruit in keeping with righteousness. What do we do then? Here's his answer. He says, what should we do then? John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Do you notice a common thread in his response? Every single person, every different group asks, well, what should we do? You're saying, do the things that are in accordance or in balance with change. What is that? And in all three responses, he gives them something that's connected to what they do with what they have. Their resources. He draws a direct connection between our spiritual lives and our financial ones. You know, as I thought about this, I think about what do I want my children to know? My children live in a culture, we all live in a culture that tells us what you have 
is what matters. Your clothes, your car, your house, what you have is what matters. It's what defines you, it gives you value. But that's not the truth, and it's not what I want my kids to know. What I want them to know is they're already defined by Jesus Christ and what he's done for them. What they do with what they have matters. You may have a lot in this world. That doesn't mean anything. What do you do with it? You may have very little in this world. That also does not mean anything. What do you do with it? What I do with what I have is what matters. So we're left with the same question that these men and women asked John. What do we do? I think there's an answer in his response. One, be generous. He looks at the individuals who come to him first. He says, if you have two shirts... Give one shirt to the person who has none. And we don't quite get that because in our culture, we swim in clothing. We have piles of clothing. We go to our closets full of clothes and say, I got nothing to wear. I don't know what I'm going to wear today. We have so much clothes, the concept doesn't even connect with us. I was serving at a a thrift store down in Philadelphia years ago. And they, I remember them telling us that they sift through two tons of clothing a day. Two tons of clothing a day. He says to these, in their culture, if you had multiple pairs of clothing, you were doing really well. Notice what he says. If you have two pairs of shirts, if you have two shirts, not if you have 10 shirts, 20 shirts, if you have two shirts, give one shirt to somebody who has none. I don't have to have a lot to be generous. We, We have this perception that if, well, if God just gave me a little bit more, then I could be more generous with people. But generosity is not based on what I possess. It's a hard attitude. So am I willing to share what God has blessed me with? I think we get caught up in our culture of affluence and luxury and think that I need to reach a certain standard of, standard of living. And until I do, I have no wiggle room in the budget to care for anybody else. But John says, be generous. What should you do? Be generous. I was, my, my mom was in town over the holidays, and some of you may know I've shared this in recent uh, sermons that we've been trying to help clean out my grandmother's house. My grandmother passed, my mom inherited that home, and my grandparents were hoarders. And I guess we labeled that because it became a show, whatever, but they were. Uh, when I went into my grandparents' house, there were boxes and clothes and stuff that went to the ceiling. You walk through aisles in their house to get to certain places. I never saw the, the kitchen table in their house except for twice a year. My grandmother would clean it up. Uh, when we were kids, if you ate a yogurt in a little plastic container, if you went to throw that yogurt away, the container, she would say, no, I can, I can use that. So You had to rinse out this plastic container and put it somewhere in the house because she might plant something in it or they, they were legitimate hoarders. So, recently, my mom and my brother have been trying to clean out. They have multiple trailers on their property. They have a big property. They have multiple trailers filled with stuff. So, my brother and my mom have been cleaning out, and she said, as I was cleaning out one of the trailers, I came across this box that was filled with material for sewing. Now, I'm not trying to defame my grandmother. Just I'll put that out there. I'm not trying to defame her. She's a wonderful lady. But she had this box filled with with material for sewing, and my mom said, years ago, I asked her, hey, you have all of that sewing material you're not using. I could use it. Could I use it? And her answer to me was no. And then what she did is she took that box, walked hundreds of yards from the house down to a trailer, put it away in that trailer so that nobody could find it, until decades later, my mom's cleaning up this mess finds a box of cloth that's been used by skunks and squirrels and every other rodent you can think of. And it's, it's a literal picture of what Jesus says, don't store up treasures on earth where rust and moth can destroy. What was the point of that? What was the point of stuffing something away so nobody else could use it? Only for decades later it to rot away, be invaluable. Useless. I remember as we were cleaning one of the rooms, it was a room that when I was a kid I never actually entered because it was so full of things you could only peek your head in the door and wonder. As a kid, there's like maybe there's treasures in there somewhere and you're wondering. 
we started cleaning that room out and pulling stuff out, and we came across this beautiful rocking chair. It was a, a love seat, two-person rocking chair, beautiful craftsmanship. And my mom started telling me a story that her parents got that when she was really young, like a toddler. And her and her sister were never allowed to sit on it. And what my grandmother did was took it back into that room, surrounded it with a bunch of stuff, and we never saw it until 40, 50 years later. Now, I'll tell you, my grandmother is presently with her Lord. I can guarantee you she could care very little about a box of cloth and a wooden wooden rocking chair. We get so caught up in this stuff. What does it really matter? So my mom's stories are I never got to touch that thing instead of, man, I can remember when I was a kid, me and my sister rocking on that and just all the joys we had. Be generous. There's far more beauty and eternality and generosity than in hoarding. Second, avoid greed and self-indulgence. When the tax collectors come to him and say, what should we do? He says, well, stop taking more than you ought to take. Now, understand their culture, I don't think we have a whole lot of love for tax collectors. I I say it as if, like, it's different. If you're a tax collector, listen, we do love you. We just don't love that you got to take our money. But in their culture, it's very, it's almost more difficult because... A tax collector was a Jewish individual taking from other Jewish men and women to give to the Romans who oppressed them. And what they would often do is they would take more than was required of them, and they could do that because they had the support of the Roman soldiers with them just to make themselves rich. So when John sees the tax collector saying, well, what should we do? Notice he doesn't say, quit your job, stop collecting taxes. He doesn't say that. He says, bring morality into your job. Put God first. Make him the priority in your job. Stop taking more than you ought to take. Let your your pay be sufficient. He looks at them and he says, don't get caught up in greed and self-indulgence. I love how Paul puts it. Paul writes, he connects greed and idolatry. He says, greed, which is idolatry. Because when I am greedy, I am the God. I want what I want for me. Jesus would actually say to the religious elite, he says, on the outside you look really great. You sound really great. But inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. It's all about you, what you desire. Self-indulgence is a very difficult thing to break free of. We've been trained it since we were children. Everybody exists for us. Some of you, your parents are middle schoolers. You know that world. Well, mom's going to come and pick up the soda cans, or mom's going to do this or that. And we have, I always tell our students, don't listen, your parents are human beings, not robots. They get depressed too. They feel lonely sometimes too. They have bad days too. They want to quit sometimes too. But guess what? They don't to support you and care for you. Maybe instead of Thinking they're robots who only exist to meet your needs and indulge you, you walk in the door and say, hey, mom, how was your day today? (coughs) Hey, dad, thanks so much for what you do. I know it's tough out there. What if we started looking at the interest of other people and considering what they've done, not solely being self-indulgent? I think there's a movement right now called the minimalists, and I think they're onto something. And I mean real minimalists. Like there are people out there who they have one fork, One spoon, one bowl, one plate. Really tough to host. Really hard on hospitality. But imagine that. Imagine if your sink was never full of dishes. I think I was thinking about it this morning. How could we pull that off? Like each of my kid has a color. They have one colored fork. Like Owen has pink forks and pink spoons. One. And if we go to eat and he's like, I don't have a fork. Where's the pink one? Hey, if you didn't wash it, you don't have one. We got one. That's all it is. I mean, there's something there to just say, you know what? I'm not going to get caught up in all this stuff. I think we, we need to learn this concept of serving others and putting these things aside and not become greedy and self-indulgent. Third, learn contentment. As the soldiers come to him and ask, what should we do? He says to them, 
you know, stop extorting people. Stop using your power to take from people. Be content with your pay, he says. I love how one of the authors in Proverbs puts it in Proverbs 30, verses 8 through 9. He says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of God. I think we, as Americans, often fall into the first category. Where we have so much that it's so easy to forget God. Who is God? Why would I even need Him? We live in so much affluence. We have so much. We forget. He says, God, don't give me so much that I forget you, but also don't give me so little that I might do something that would dishonor your name. Because I've recognized in my life that God continues to meet your needs. And the start towards contentment is an understanding of a, the difference between a want and a need. We have very skewed perceptions of need in our society. When our seven-year-olds say, I need a phone. No, you do not. You want a phone. When you can, and listen, we're all different. I was talking to somebody the other day about my 13-year-old, about to be 13-year-old. And I was saying it's hard to shop for them for Christmas because it's different now. They said, well, do they have a phone? I'm like, no, not happening. When he could afford his phone, he can have a phone. But until then, he's not getting one. We have this concept of need and want, and they're very skewed. Contentment starts with understanding what I need. God always has proven in my life to provide what I need. There have been times in my life, and I know this has not been everybody's experience, but there have been times in my life that God has done the miraculous. Where I can remember when my wife was pregnant, times when she was pregnant, we were living in Florida, and our income was what it was, and our budget was what it was, and they were right in line. She would say, I have to stop working. And I would ride home saying, God, I have no clue how we're going to make it work and a check would show up in my mailbox at the church. I've had checks in the mail moments in my life. And you, God has performed miracles, but he always does it through his people. And think about that for a moment. You could be a part of God's miracle simply by saying, I'm going to use God's resources the way he, he leads me to use them. And be generous. God continues to meet our needs, but contentment and truth is found solely in understanding what I need more than anything in the world is Jesus Christ. Paul says this in Philippians 4. He says, I've learned to be content in all circumstances. With my stomach full, with my stomach empty, in wealth, in poverty. And then there's a great statement, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The thing that if you buy any Steph Curry shoes, it's written on the back of his shoes, I can do all things. But it's not I can shoot threes at an alarming percentage. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying I can be content through Christ who strengthens me, whether my stomach is full or empty, whether I'm rich or poor, whatever I have, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because He is my fulfillment. Earlier he said, I rejoice in the Lord always, not in my circumstance. And he wrote that while he's sitting in prison. He understood that life is found in God. Fulfillment is found in God. You may not want to hear that this morning, but that's how God made you. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them to find life in him. If you asked Adam before sin... If you asked him, what is life, he would have a one-word answer, God. Where do you get value, Adam? God. Where's your purpose come from, Adam? God. What's the meaning of life, Adam? God. And then he chose to be his own God. And all of a sudden, this connection to life was stripped from him. God said to Adam and Eve, the moment you eat of the fruit, you will die. Well, his physical life didn't end in that moment. What died? His spirit and connection to life in full. Thanks 
to God, Jesus Christ came to restore us to life. Jesus Christ came to bring us back to the source and sustainer of all life. Contentment, fulfillment is found in Jesus Christ. Guys, what matters is not what you have or don't have. What matters is what you do with what you have, and it's bigger than money. What matters is what you do with your resources, your gifts. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that you have been gifted by the Spirit. You have gifts of grace. How do you use those gifts? Your talents, your abilities. There are people in this room who could sew things, who can mechanically fix things, who could build things, things that I cannot do. I've accepted that. I put people on my phone. I call them when I need those things. How do you use what you have? I heard this story. I went, to, went with a friend to a banquet. And this guy was talking about us using what God has given us in any arena. And he had this guy in his church who was wrestling because he's like, I'm just a mechanic. How could I actually impact the kingdom of God as a mechanic? Well, in comes this young man who had a family. I think he had five children, and he was struggling. His van was breaking down. He could not afford to fix it. He comes into the guy. The guy starts looking at the van. The total bill is going to be about $1,000. The guy can't afford it. So he comes out to the man, this young man, he says, listen, I'm going to take care of your van for you. He's like, I can't pay for that. So you're going to pay for it, but here's how. For the next two months, you're going, you and your whole family is going to come to church with me every Sunday. He's like, what? That's all I got to give you? He's like, yeah. So for the next two months, that man and his family came to church with him. In that two months, he came to believe in Jesus Christ. All of his family came to believe in Jesus Christ. He found a man in the church who offered him a job. He got a job. He got an, like, this man is recognizing that I'm a mechanic. And God has given me that resource to do something amazing with it. Don't sit there and say, well, I just this or I just that. Whatever God has given you, use it for the kingdom and God's glory. What you do with what you have matters, not what you have. So in that, I want to leave you with some simple money mindsets. I say simple because they're simple in concept, but harder to grasp. Money mindsets that I, I borrow from Randy Alcorn's book, The Treasure Principle, I think they're really powerful challenges. Here's the first. God owns everything. I am just his money manager. You and I own nothing. Here's what Psalms 24 1 says The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Guess where you are? On the earth. Guess where your car is? Guess where your house is? Guess where your dogs are? Guess where your kids are? The earth is whose? The Lord's and everything in it. God owns everything. I'm simply his manager. He's given to me to steward what he's given to me, to use it well. If I can gather this, this perception that it's not mine. Remember, guys, I've, I've interacted with guys who are like, hey, can I ride your motorcycle? Yeah, it's, it's God's bike. Go ahead. And they've fully adopted that concept. That's God's. Go for it. Now, somebody asked me after first service, well, does that mean God have my debt too? Yeah, absolutely. He took your debt. In fact, Jesus Christ took your greatest debt, the debt of sin. His consequence, he took it to a cross and he paid for it. God owns everything. I'm just his manager. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, For who makes you different from anyone, anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not? God gives me more than salvation, the very breath in my lungs he's given me. So what do I do with what God has given me? God gave you your bodies. We don't talk about that a lot. Maybe I'm going to step on toes. We're going to talk about that. God gave us our bodies. Do we manage those well? Yeah, I'm not going to go down that road. Second, I can't take it with me, but I can send it ahead. But Jesus says, do not store up treasures on this earth where rust and moth will destroy, but instead store it up in heaven. I'm not, I'm not going to take anything with me. They get older, and as I, we were just talking, I was talking to somebody earlier this morning that I, we're hitting this phase where I know that my parents are getting to a point where soon they're going to pass on into the next world. 
And all of a sudden you start recognizing what matters and what doesn't. None of the stuff is going to go with me. Somebody else is going to claim it. It's going to corrode away. But I can use what I have to do something for eternity. I could use whatever resources God has given me to impact somebody's life, to lead them to Christ, to spread the kingdom. Can't take it with me, but I can send it ahead. Third, giving is the only antidote for materialism. I hear so often people say, I just struggle with our materialism as, as a culture. I don't want to get caught up in materialism. The fix, the antidote to materialism is generosity, giving. We don't want to get caught up in that, then be generous. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul says to Timothy, command the rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Notice that. If I'm generous, it doesn't mean that I don't get to enjoy. Because God has richly provided everything for our enjoyment. But then he goes on, says, command them to be good or to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Some of the most generous people I know when I talk to them, guess what words they use? It's fun. It's fulfilling. It's exciting. It's encouraging. Those are the terms. That's, when he says that they may take hold of life that is truly life, generosity creates real living. When somebody's caught up in trying to get the next thing and have the next fulfillment, what I hear is empty. Yeah, it wasn't that great. It wasn't all it's chalked up to be. Generosity is the antidote to materialism. Here's the fourth and final one. God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul writes, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that, here's why he's able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, not want, you will abound in every good work. God is able to bless you abundantly so that you can be a blessing to other people. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, freely tossed it away, and what they receive in return, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply an increase and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What I think Paul is saying is that if I live with this concept of, okay, God, I'm ready, but I stay here. As God gives, the hands are open, ready to give it away, ready to bless others, ready to be generous and care for others. I have open hands to still receive. The moment I start trying to grip to what God has given me, I not only close my hands to generosity, I close my hands to the blessings that God wants to continue to pour out in my life to be used for the service and goodness of others. You may not have a lot, but you do not have to have a lot to do something that matters. What will you do with what you do have? That's what matters. You will never be defined in this church by what you have. We want to be caught up with what we do with what we have. The grace that God has given us, the blessing that he has given us, to live in tune, the generosity and sacrifice that has been given to us through Jesus Christ. Do not like an earthly father gave 10% to a priest, like a heavenly father gave everything to us. So if you have the means to meet a need, then meet it. If not, it's not on you. But be willing to 
Say, God, okay, it's yours. Whatever you want to do with it, do with it. It's not a sermon about give us your money. We want your money as a church. It's not what it's about. I want you to experience life that is real life. And it's not found in stuff. It's not found in, like my grandparents, filling up the house. It's found in opening my hands and being willing to serve as God calls me to serve. If God stirs in you. There's a guy named Francis Chan. I'm, I'm, I'm going to close here, seriously. There's a guy named Francis Chan. He's a preacher, pastor. He, he, in a personal conviction, got to this point where he said, if, if God says, love your neighbor as yourself, that means 50% of my income goes to somebody else. Now, that's wild. And I'm not there. But that's his conviction. And he said, okay, let's go. And he figured it out. However God stirs in your heart, he says, God loves a cheerful giver. However God stirs in your heart, listen and respond and trust that God can take care of your needs. We're not going to close in a money song. I'm not going to sing any mo money, mo problems, any of that. I'm just going to close in prayer and let you go. But God, I thank you so much for all of your blessings in our lives. We, we fail to see them so often and fail to recognize that we have been blessed abundantly, the things that we have in our culture and our society. I know there are men and women in here who help support kids all around the world, kids in the Dominican who are just getting fresh, clean water is a, it's a process. But we have so much abundance. Lord, help us to use it to further your kingdom, to expand your glory in the world. We would not get caught up in self-indulgence and greed. That we would live with open hands to serve one another, to care for one another, to experience life that is really life. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hope to see you back next week. <laughs>